The bestial transformation occurred when Allah turned Jews into apes. Let's move more deeply into the second year of the Islamic era to see how Muhammad perpetrated his fraud. Tabari, Allah changed the Muslim Qibla from Jerusalem to the Kaaba in the second year of residence in Medina. The people used to pray toward Jerusalem. He used to raise his head to see what he would be commanded. This was abrogated in favor of the Kaaba, the true source of his inspiration. When the Prophet arrived in Yathrib, he demeaned the Kaaba, as this conversation with his new, real new, wife suggests. Bukhari, the Apostle said to Asia, Don't you see that your folk did not build the Kaaba on the foundations built by Abraham? I said, O oh, Apostle, why don't we rebuild it on them? He said, but for the fact your folk have recently given up infidelity. Umar agreed. Asha must have heard this from Allah's apostle, for he never touched the two corners facing Al-Hijr, because the house had not been built on the right foundations. Confession is good for the soul. But this disdain could not last. Jerusalem was claimed by the God of the Jews, and was in their land. For Muhammad to be important, for him to succeed in his quest, he needed something close at hand. Perhaps the Kaaba could be buffed up a bit, legitimized by a little plagiarized and situational scripture. Bukhari. While some people were offering prayer, a man came and said, Quranic literature has been revealed to Allah's apostle tonight. He is ordered to face the Kaaba at Mecca, so you should turn your faces toward it. At that moment they were facing Jerusalem. So they turned toward the Kaaba. Allah was always so accommodating. Bukhari. The prophet prayed facing Jerusalem, but he wished that his Qibla would be facing the Kaaba at Mecca. So Allah revealed the Quran. A man who had prayed with him went out and said, I swear I have prayed with the prophet facing Mecca. Hearing that, they turned their faces to the Kaaba while they were still bowing. Some men had died before the Qibla was changed, and we did not know what to say about them, whether their prayers toward Jerusalem were accepted or not. If the Islamic God were everywhere, all-powerful, ever-listening, always watchful, why would he care which direction a devotee turned in prayer? Why all the fuss? To quote a Meccan, there must be some motive behind this. Personally, I think it was to dump on the Jews. Bukhari. People say, whenever you sit for answering the call of nature, you should not face the Qibla of Jerusalem. I told them, once I went up to the roof of our house, and I saw Allah's apostle answering the call of nature while sitting on two bricks facing Jerusalem. Since this is supposed to be a religion, let's review the first surah revealed in Medina to find a more inspired reason. The second surah, the Quran's longest, is really its first surah as the first is the prologue, a sixty-word invocation. Its speaker isn't Allah. The second surah, which was the ninetieth received, is called the cow, in reference to the golden calf cast by the Israelites during their exodus nearly two thousand years before Islam was invented. Muslim scholars acknowledge that the surah was handed down in pieces over the course of a decade. Madudi, our Quranic scholar, says, The cow has been so named from the story of the golden calf associated with Moses. It has not, however, been used as a title to indicate the subject of the surah. It will, therefore, be as wrong to translate the name al-Baqarah into the cow as to translate any English name, say, baker, rice, or wolf, into their equivalents in other languages, or vice versa, because this would imply that the surah dealt with the subject of the cow. This argument is as irrational as it is telling. It goes to the very heart of Muhammad's deception. Names and words are different things. We can and should translate the word for the profession of baker, but never the name of a person named baker.
Bakara is the Arabic word for cow. It is not the name of a cow. Similarly, Il and Ilah are Arabic words for God, not the names of gods. Words for things must always be translated, while the personal names of deities and people should never be. Our Rachman, Allah, and Yahweh are the personal names of very different gods. Anyone who replaces the name Allah with the word God is guilty of deceiving their audience and of contradicting the Quran. Madudi goes on to explain. The greater part of al Bakara was revealed during the first two years of the Prophet's life at Medina. Some of it was revealed at a later period and has been included in this surah because its contents are closely related to those dealt with in this surah. For instance, the verses prohibiting interest were revealed during the last period of the Prophet's life. For the same reason, the last verses of this surah were revealed in Mecca before the migration of the Prophet. This argument is inconsistent with the Quran as a whole. If it were God's plan to have like subjects grouped together, the never-ending argument and related depictions of hellish torments wouldn't be randomly strewn throughout the book. All things related to Moses would be brought together, not disseminated in two dozen surahs. Further, the last verses are unrelated to the business discussion preceding them. They are therefore out of context and chronology. A perfect book cannot by definition be disordered. Yet there is a larger problem. The surah contains the verse on abrogation which says, Whenever we cancel a message or throw it into oblivion, we replace it with a better one. Without dismembering the entire Quran so that every line follows the revelation which immediately preceded it, the cancel and replace concept is futile. How is anyone to know which verses Allah threw into oblivion? Without context and chronology, the cancel and replace verse renders the entire Quran irrelevant. If one line discourages slavery and another condones it, which is to be believed? If one verse says that infidels are to be taxed to death, and others order them put to death, what are Muslims to do? The answer is obvious, but apparently not to Muslims or to those in our state houses, media, and pulpits, who coddle Islam. A god who changes his mind repeatedly over a score of years, and needs a verse to deal with his contradictions, cannot be God. A religion devoted to a false spirit isn't worth protecting, especially when it motivates men to murder. Madudi wasn't finished incriminating his religion. At Mecca, the Quran generally addressed the Quraysh who were ignorant of Islam. At Medina, it was concerned with the Jews who were acquainted with the unity of Allah, prophethood, revelation, the hereafter, and angels. They also professed to believe in the law which was revealed by Allah to their prophet Moses. And in principle, their way was the same Islam that was being taught by the prophet Muhammad. Like all things Islam, the truth has been inverted. The reason both Jews and Muslims believed in prophets, revelation, and angels was because Muhammad stole these concepts, words, and names from them. Further, Jews believed in the oneness of Yahweh, not in some pathetic rock idol named Allah. They knew that the dark spirit of the Quran was Satan. It's obvious to anyone familiar with the Bible. Yahweh used his name 7,000 times in his scriptures. Allah's name was never mentioned. The closest Hebrew word means oak tree. The Jews had a word for God, too. It was El, and they used it when describing pagan idols, like the Islamic deity. As for the Jewish way being the same Islam, that's Meshugana. Jewish prophets predicted the future and condemned immoral behavior. The Islamic prophet authorized immoral behavior and condemned the future. They are opposites. Torah means instructions and prescriptions, not laws, but either way those guidelines were summarized in the Ten Commandments. Mohammed declared war on all of them, as did his God. They could not have been chiseled in stone by the rock idol who established a false doctrine promoting theft and murder. I would like to give Madudi another chance. 
since this is the fulcrum surah of the Quran, more change than just the Qibla. He wrote, The Jews had strayed away from Islam during the centuries of degeneration, and had adopted many un-Islamic creeds, rites, and customs, of which there was no mention, and for which there was no sanction in the Torah. Not only this, they had tampered with the Torah by inserting their own explanations and interpretations into its text. They had distorted even that part of the Word of God which had remained intact in their scriptures, and had taken out of it the real spirit of true religion, and were now clinging to a lifeless frame of rituals. This is the very heart of the matter. It is the Quran's justification, its sole tenuous hope of authenticity. It is the reason for the change in Quibla, and the impetus behind Islamic hatred and Muslim militancy. If Islam were not so ruthless, so fixated on submission for the benefit of cleric and king, this assertion would have killed it. The claim that the Torah was inspired by Allah, and that its characters were Muslims, requires it to have been corrupted beyond recognition. The Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls prove beyond any doubt that tampering did not occur. Since archaeology has proven that the Jews did not distort the Torah, the Quran must be a lie. Mohammed deceived men on behalf of a god no bigger than the rock he occupied. However, it was not all as simple as that. The dark spirit that inspired Mohammed to make these preposterous claims was in a predicament himself. He, like his prophet, was covetous, so Satan wanted what belonged to Yahweh, the Jews, and their Torah. It is no coincidence that a race representing a tiny fraction of one percent of the world's population became the victim of Islam's wrath. It should be no surprise that modern history's most famous occultist, Adolf Hitler, also wrapped himself in Bible symbols and picked the same enemy. They were both possessed by the same spirit. I dedicated the Bad Boys chapter in Tea with Terrorist to exposing the similarity between these men and their doctrines. I encourage you to read it if you haven't already. Considering that Mohammed indulged in pedophilia, led a dozen terrorist raids, inspired thievery, kidnapping, and murder, and said that his spirit approved such things, Madhudi's comments are astonishing. Consequently, their Jewish beliefs, their morals, and their conduct had gone to the lowest depths of degeneration. The pity is that they were not only satisfied with their condition, but loved to cling to it. Besides this, they had no inclination to accept any kind of reform. So they became bitter enemies of those who came to teach them the right way, and did their worst to defeat every effort. Though they were originally Muslims, they had swerved from real Islam, and made alterations in it, and had fallen victims to hair-splitting. They had forgotten and forsaken Allah so much so, that they had even given up their original name Muslim, and had adopted the name Jew instead. They made religion the sole monopoly of the Jews. Islam is apparently contagious. Madhudi has become delusional. It's pathetic that Islamic clerics have to lie to make their prophet, scripture, God, and religion appear believable. These ideas are preposterous, wholly incongruous with history and reason. And while countless clerics have mumbled foolish things on behalf of their meal ticket, this is not Madhudi's interpretation. This gross deception is proclaimed throughout the Quran. I recognize that we've been over this material before, but it's essential that you appreciate the impossibility of Islam's position. For Yahweh to have been Allah, for Jerusalem to have been Mecca, for the Temple to have been the Kaaba, for Judaism to have been Islam, for Jews to have been Muslims, most every word on most every page of the Bible would have to have been corrupted, as would world history. While there is no intersection of history and Islam prior to Muhammad's death, Judeo-Christianity lived in the crossroads of nations. Imagine millions of people not knowing who they were, where they were, what they were doing, or why. Imagine dismembering thousands of Torahs, books of the prophets and Psalms in a massive conspiratorial fashion, 
so that they would all be exactly the same, so that they would all deny their name, their purpose, their city, their temple, their God. Not only would thousands, at the time non-existent, Islamic symbols, names, and places have had to have been edited out, the Jewish symbols, names, and places would have to have been surreptitiously and universally substituted. And for what? To foil a demon-possessed, dictatorial tyrant who wouldn't be born for two thousand years? But alas, it's no greater leap of faith to believe the impossible corruption occurred than to believe that Islam is divine. The reason I encouraged you to read about biblical archaeology was so that you might have an appreciation for the magnitude of this deception. The twentieth century brought an explosion of historically based biblical verifications. Virtually every place, person, custom, and event depicted in the Bible has been shown to have been grounded in history. And every single archaeological artifact, from Noah to Abraham, from Moses to Yeshua, is evidenced scripturally and dated to a time preceding Mecca's existence. Since the historically verified people, places, and dates correspond perfectly to the biblical account, things cannot be as the Quran protests. Islam is therefore a lie. One last dose of Madhudi is in order. A tiny Islamic state has been set up with the help of the Ansar, the local supporters. So naturally the Quran had to turn its attention to the social, economic, political, and legal matters. This accounts for the difference between the surahs revealed at Mecca and Medina. Half of this surah deals with the regulations essential for the solidarity of a community. At least we agree on one thing. Islam was more about politics than religion, and we should treat it as such. To understand the second surah, we must view it in context of Yathrib, a town ten times the size of Mecca. It was principally a Jewish community. The Yathrib Jews were considerably more literate and prosperous than those who had mocked Muhammad's prophetic credentials in Mecca. Thin-skinned and insecure, the wannabe prophet chafed at their verbal abuse. As he had with the Meccans, Muhammad unleashed his God's wrath on his tormentors. Ibn Ishaq devotes forty pages, five percent of his sirah, to Muhammad's awkward transition from wanting to be the Jewish Messiah to being the Jews' mortal enemy. The Prophet goes from being dependent upon the Jews for scriptural inspiration to condemning their scriptures. In the process he becomes a pathological liar. Everything he says of himself, his God, his scriptures, is not only false, the opposite is actually true. The first 176 verses of the second surah are devoted to Muhammad's newfound critics. Allah eagerly details the punishments that await Jews putting the Quran in the untenable position of attacking the book, people, and religion that allegedly inspired it. Let's see why. Ishak, about this time Jewish rabbis showed hostility to the apostle in envy, hatred, and malice, because Allah had chosen his apostle from the Arabs. The Jews considered the prophet a liar and strove against him. The Jews were not deceived. The Aus and Khazraj joined the Jews by obstinately clinging to their heathen religion. They were hypocrites. When Islam appeared and their people flocked to it, they were compelled to pretend to accept it and save their lives. This means that fundamental Islam, the Islam of the Prophet Muhammad, was so immoral, intolerant, and violent, Arabs had to feign support to keep from getting killed. In that regard, it was no different than Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Russia. And Islam hasn't changed one iota. Every Muslim in every Islamic nation is still compelled to pretend to accept it to save their lives. Ishak, Jewish rabbis used to annoy the apostle with questions, introducing confusion. There was a reason neither prophet nor God tolerated questions. To know Muhammad, Allah and Islam, is to be disgusted by them. Their doctrine is a lie, their behavior is despicable, and the result is murderous. Qurans used to come down in reference to their questions. Ishak lists the sixty Jewish inquisitors by name. Then, Ishak, 
Labid bewitched Allah's apostles so that he could not come at his wives. Apparently, Muhammad became as impotent as his God. These Jewish rabbis opposed the apostle. They asked questions and stirred up trouble against Islam, trying to extinguish it. They may have failed, but their legacy can help us today. Alfred Gulim, the author who translated Ibn Ishaq's Life of Muhammad into English, adds a worrisome footnote to the end of the bewitched allegation. He says the best Islamic scholars attest that this tradition is sound. Other sources explain that the spell lasted for a year. But modernists reject the tradition on the ground that prophets cannot be bewitched. Otherwise, they would sin and contradict Allah's Quran. They agree that the Hadith is properly attested. In other words, that its isnad, or chain of transmitters, is sound. But don't believe it is acceptable for prophets to be afflicted by sorcery. Fortunately, there is a test to determine the influence of sorcery. Were the prophet's motivations caring or covetous? Were his words truthful or deceitful? Were his deeds just or immoral? I'll let you make that call. As you ponder the source of Muhammad's inspiration, think about why spiritual inquiry would stir up trouble for a religion. Since a true prophet is called to reveal truth by answering questions, why would one object to them? Ishaq tells us that one Jew was deceived, selling his soul for a buck. His name, according to Muhammad, was Abd Allah ibn Salam. But I find that hard to believe. The Arabic and Hebrew word for Jew is Yehudi, as in the followers of Yahweh, not slave to Allah. So this is just another Islamic deception. Ishaq I concealed the matter from the Jews, and then went to the apostle, and said, The Jews are a nation of liars, and I want you to give me a house and hide me from them. The Jews were not a nation in the seventh century, which made at least one Jew a liar. If they learn I've become a Muslim, they'll utter scandalous lies against me. So the prophet gave me a house, and when the Jews came, I emerged and said, O oh, Jews, fear Allah and accept what he has sent you. For you know that he is the apostle of Allah. You will find him described in your Torah and even named. They accused me of lying and reviled me. I told Muhammad, the Jews are a treacherous, lying, and evil people. Did Abd Allah betray God for a house? Here are some clues. Allah means oak in Hebrew. So this man's name was slave to a tree. He said, your Torah, not our Torah. He claimed that Muhammad was described in it, when in fact no prophet was ever described in Scripture. The Jews didn't believe in apostles. That was a Christian thing. Apostle comes from the Greek word apostolos, which means to be sent out as an ambassador. Jews never evangelized. The name Muhammad does not appear anywhere in the Bible. Lastly, a learned Jew would quote the Torah reference, and none was mentioned. Ishak, Muhairik, was a learned rabbi, owning much property in date palms. He recognized the apostle by his description and felt a predilection for his religion. He violated the Sabbath to fight on behalf of Islam and was killed in battle. I am told the prophet used to say, Muhairik is the best of the Jews. Yeah, he was a dead one. The apostle took his property. Ishak, Julus the Jew used to say, If Muhammad is right, we are worse than donkeys. Allah sent down concerning him. They swear that they did not say it when they did say the words of unbelief. Allah will afflict them with painful punishment in this world and in the next. This became Surah 975. God must have been a bit tardy, however, with this condemnation as the ninth surah wouldn't be handed down for another nine years. Ishak, the apostle ordered Umar to kill him, but he escaped to Mecca. This next hadith sports a long and distinguished isnad. There must be a reason. Ishak, I have heard the apostle say, whoever wants to see Satan should look at Nabtal. He was a sturdy black man with long flowing hair, inflamed eyes, and dark ruddy cheeks. He used to come and talk with the prophet and listen to him. 
he would carry what he said to the hypocrites. Nabtal said, Muhammad is all ears. If anyone tells him something, he believes it. Allah sent down concerning him, To those who annoy the prophet and say that he is all ears, say, Good ears for you. For those who annoy the apostle, there is a painful punishment. This became Surah 961. Gabriel came to Muhammad and said, If a black man comes to you, his heart is more gross than a donkey's. The Islamic prophet was an equal opportunity racist. It was so tolerant of him. I wonder if Louis Farrakhan ever preached from this hadith. The He is all ears line is telling. It's possible a Jew told Muhammad he was mentioned in their scriptures. Not being able to read, he believed what he heard. Ishak. Muhammad promised that we would enjoy the treasures of the Persians and the Romans, but it isn't safe for us to go to the privy. Allah revealed, The hypocrites and those with diseased hearts say Allah and his apostle have promised nothing but delusion. Uh, this jewel became Quran 33.12. Well, privy or not, this stinks. Muhammad lured Muslims into Islam with promises of booty. It's another confirmation of the profitable prophet plan. Ishak and Tabati disagree as to when this conversation occurred and when the charge was leveled. While I agree with the historian's timing, the message is really all that matters. So I'm going to cover these hadith as they arise in both chronologies. Ishak, Hatib was a sturdy man steeped in paganism. Yazid, his son, was one of the best Muslims when he was disabled by wounds. At the point of death, Muslims said, Rejoice, son of Hatib, in the thought of paradise. Then his father's hypocrisy showed itself. He said, hm, It is a garden of rue. You have sent my son to his death by your deception. Concerning him, Allah said, Argue not on behalf of those who deceive themselves. Allah does not love a sinful deceiver. And that jewel became Quran 4107. I am bereaved of words. Muhammad, however, was not. Ishak. The apostle used to say, He belongs to the people of hell. Yet he has fought valiantly and killed many polytheists. So when he became severely wounded, Muslims said, Cheer up, you have done gallantly, and your sufferings have been for Allah's sake. Why should I cheer up? I fought to protect my people. When the pain of his wounds became unbearable, he took an arrow from his quiver, slit his wrists, and committed suicide. He was suspected of hypocrisy and loved Jews. This poem was written of him. Who will tell him that by cutting his vein he won't be glorified in Islam? Do you love Jews and their religion, you liver-hearted ass, and not Muhammad? Their religion will never march with ours. With each new line, Muhammad's heart grew darker and his spirit became more aligned with Satan's. His reaction to the boy's death and his father's suffering were perverse. And he was responsible. He had deceived him. And while that's bad, consider the damage done to Islam. The Torah and Quran were supposed to be the same. Islam was supposed to be uncorrupted Judaism. But now, their religion will never march with ours. Ishak I have heard that Julus the Jew used to make false professions of Islam. So Allah sent down, Satan wishes to lead them astray. Yes, he most certainly does. And he did this in Quran 4.63. This is one of the many verses Allah uses to coax young Muslim boys into becoming terrorists. Ishak, O oh Muhammad, give me permission to stay at home and don't tempt me to fight. So Allah sent down, of him who says, Give me leave to stay home and tempt me not, surely it is into temptation they have fallen, and hell encompasses them. You'll find this in 949. The Quran says that peaceful Muslims who refuse the temptation of booty for fighting jihad in Allah's cause will be roasted in hell. Ishaq the surah of the hypocrites came down because some men sent secret messages to the Nadir Jews when the apostle besieged them. So Allah sent down, Have you not considered the hypocrites who say to their brethren, the people of the book, that would be Jews, 
we shall never obey anyone but you. If you are attacked by the Muslims and driven out, we will help you. Allah bears witness that they are liars, like Satan, when he says to men, Disbelieve. This became Quran 59.11. The surah goes on to say, In Quran 59.14, They are a divided people devoid of sense. There is a grievous punishment awaiting them. Satan tells them not to believe, so both of them will end up in hell. Other hadith say this surah was handed down regarding the expulsion of the Kwanuka Jews and the confiscation of their property rather than the nadir. The 59th surah, called Confrontation, was one of many anti-Semitic rants. Highlights include Quran 59 verse 2 It was he, Allah, who drove the Jewish people of the book from their Yathrib or Medina homes and into exile. They refused to believe. You did not think that they would go away, and they imagined that their settlement would protect them against Allah. But Allah's, actually Muhammad's, torment came at them from where they did not suspect and terrorized them. Their homes were destroyed. So learn a lesson, O men who have eyes. This is my warning. Had Allah not decreed the expulsion of the Jews, banishing them into the desert, he would certainly have punished them in this world, and in the next they shall taste the torment of hell fire. Why, you may wonder, were the Jews terrorized? Why were their homes stolen and destroyed? Why were Jewish families pushed into the desert to die? Why does Allah want to abuse them? Quran 59.4 That is because they resisted Allah and opposed His Messenger. If anyone resists Allah, verily Allah is severe in punishment, stern in reprisal. Verse 6 what Allah gave as booty to his messenger, he has taken away from them. For this you made no raid. Allah gives his messenger lordship over whomever he wills. Allah is able to do all things. Whatever booty Allah has given to his messenger and taken away from the Jewish people of the townships belongs to Allah and his messenger. So take what the messenger assigns to you and deny yourselves that which he withholds from you. Fear Allah. Allah is severe in punishment. Someone may have spoken more demented words than these, but surely no one ever attributed them to God. To call Muhammad an anti-Semitic psychopath is too kind. Three of Muhammad's greatest flaws were included in this racist rant. He was greedy. He wanted the entire spoil for himself. Muhammad had his God say that the Muslim militants who besieged the Jewish settlement weren't entitled to anything. A blockade, according to the Dark Spirit, was less deserving of booty than a terrorist raid. Muhammad was abusive. When the Jews wouldn't submit to his authority and crown him a Messiah, he starved a thousand families into submission. He stole their homes, property, businesses, and money. He threw them into the desert to die. Muhammad was also delusional. Having had his mercenaries blockade the township, the prophet said that it was really his God who had terrorized them. Then he assuaged his guilt by saying that had he not cast the Jews out and stolen their homes, his spirit buddy would have dealt them an even more vicious blow. For emphasis, I edited the means to this madness out of the passage. Muhammad bribed his mercenaries. He stole to acquire and motivate raiders. He literally bought their loyalty. Check out what followed the ellipsis in the previous verse. Whatever booty Allah has given to his messenger and taken away from the people of the townships belongs to Allah and his messenger. And here's the ellipsis. For near relations of Muhammad, his family and wives, the orphans, himself and the children of his dead raiders, and the needy wayfarers, his Meccan loyalists. In later hadith, Muhammad will admit to using spoils to buy loyalty. While the mercenary nature of the first Muslims is strongly implied here, it will become blatantly obvious with time. One last note before we return to Ishak's narrative. What was Allah going to do with the stolen property? 
Did Mohammed throw the booty toward the Kaaba and ask Allah to grab whatever he wanted, or was this all a ruse? Ishak attempts to prove that the profiteer was a prophet too. Jewish rabbis who took refuge in Islam hypocritically said one day after Muhammad's camel had wandered off, he alleges that revelations came to him from heaven, yet he doesn't even know where his camel is. When the apostle heard what this enemy of Allah had said, Allah told him where his camel was. It's in such and such a glen. Surely it was in that very spot. One day the wind blew. Ishak. The prophet said, Don't be afraid, the wind is blowing because a great unbeliever is dead. When he got back to Medina, he found that a hypocrite had died the day the wind blew. The prophet's preaching must have been as uninspired as his scripture, because... Ishak. Those hypocrites used to assemble in the mosque and listen to the stories of the Muslims and laugh and scoff at their religion. So Muhammad ordered that they should be ejected. They were thrown out with great violence. Abu went to Amr, who was a custodian of the gods. He took his foot and dragged him out of the mosque. Another Muslim slapped the man's face while dragging him forcefully. Keep out of the apostle's mosque, you hypocrite, he said. Another was punched in the chest and knocked down. One was pulled violently by his hair. Don't come near the apostle's mosque again, for you are unclean. The first hundred verses of the cow surah came down in reference to these Jewish rabbis and hypocrites. This is fundamental Islam at its very best. The Hadith goes on to explain the purpose of this new religion. Ishak, it is a guide for those who fear Allah's punishment. It is for those who believe in the unseen, perform prostrations, share what Allah provides with the apostle, and pay the zakat tax, expecting a reward. Then speaking of the Jews, Muhammad had his God say, Ishak, Allah has sealed their hearts and their hearing blinding them so that they will never find guidance. And that is because they have declared you a liar, and they do not believe in what has come down to you from their Lord, even though they believe in all that came down before you. For opposing you, they will have an awful punishment. According to Muhammad, the reason the Jews rejected him had nothing to do with his hypocrisy his acting like a pirate while pretending to be a prophet. It had nothing to do with the demented nature of his scripture. Their denial was a miracle from God. How's that for delusional? Healing the sick wasn't part of Allah's repertoire. Ishak, Allah increases their sickness. A torment of doom awaits the Jews. The terrorist spirit known as Allah said, They are mischief-makers, they are fools. The Jews deny the truth and contradict what the Apostle has brought. Allah said, I will mock them and let them continue to wander blindly. Muhammad was personally guilty of everything he falsely attributed to the Jews. As a terrorist raider, he was a mischief-maker. He was a fool denying truth. And it was Muhammad who contradicted the Torah twisting Hebrew scripture to serve his interests. Arabs and Jews alike were openly doubting the prophet's preposterous claims. Ishak, the apostle calls to you the truth about which there is no doubt, and if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to him, or in doubt about what he says, then produce a surah like it and summon witnesses other than Allah. But you won't, because you can't, for the truth is beyond doubt. Fear hell, whose fuel is men and stones prepared for the infidels. Posturing, propaganda, and threats are standard rhetoric for despots everywhere. Most are more credible, however, than was Muhammad. Inviting Jews to Islam, the prophet preached, Ishak, stand in awe of me, lest I bring down on you what I brought down on your fathers, the vengeance that you know of, the bestial transformation, and the like. Turning Jews into apes and swine was Allah's perverse rendition of bestiality. Believe in what I have sent down, confirming what you already have. Be not the first to disbelieve it. This became Quran 2.41. The Jews weren't in a race. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's ironic in a way. Had the Jews not been in Yathrib, 
Islam would never have survived. Without the money Mohammed confiscated by stealing Jewish homes, property, and businesses, and selling Jewish women and children into slavery, he wouldn't have been able to bribe enough militants to conquer the merchants of Mecca, much less the whole Middle East. Without the scripture he bought from the Yathrib Jews, Muhammad wouldn't have had enough religious material to make the Quran appear believable. Void of bastardized Bible stories, Islam's holy book is little more than hellish threats, lewd enticements, racist rants, and a call to war. Ishak, fear me and do not mingle truth with falsehood or hide the truth which you know. Do not conceal the knowledge which you have about my messenger. You recognize what he has brought to you because you will find it in the books that are in your hands. You are readers of scripture. Why do you forbid men to believe in the prophecy you have and in the covenant of the Torah? You must pronounce my apostle to be true. This lie became Quran 240. Give a dishonest man enough rope and he will eventually hang himself. Desperately trying to establish his own credibility, Muhammad destroyed the last bastion of Allah's. The line, You will find it with you in the books that are in your hands, says that the Torah of the 7th century A.D. confirmed Muhammad's Islam. It contained prophecy pointing to him. Its covenant was what he brought. According to Allah, the Torah proclaimed that the Apostle was true, but nothing could be further from true. The Hebrew text of Muhammad's day matches today's Torah verbatim. Read it and weep. Sorry, pal, you're dead. To demonstrate just how feeble Muhammad's mental prowess really was, I present the surah's next paragraph. Ishak, Allah said to them, Enter the gate with prostrations, and say, Hitta, say what I command you. But they changed that word, making mockery of his command. With regard to their changing that word, the apostle said, according to someone above suspicion, they entered the gate they were ordered to enter with prostrations in a crowd saying, Wheat is in the barley. Yep, the Torah that just anointed messiahship upon the Arab prophet was now corrupt. The Jews had edited the Arabic word hitta from their scriptures, making a mockery of Allah's commands. Unfortunately, the Arabic word wouldn't come to have been written for 2,000 years. Yet we're told it was edited out of written scripture. If you're curious, hitta means unloading. It's nonsensical. And barley and wheat were associated with the Meccans and their idol Manat. Ishaq, page 39, not Yahweh and the Jews. Muhammad was as dumb as the rock he called God. You can fix a lot of things but you can't fix stupid. The paragraph goes on to report, Ishak, Allah raised the mountains above the Jews so that they might receive what was brought to them, and the bestial transformation occurred when Allah turned Jews into apes. This became Quran 2.65. A billion souls believe this beast of a man was a prophet. Sadly, they don't know his spirit was satanic. I'm certain the Yathrib Jews told him that his five pillars conflicted with Yahweh's Ten Commandments. So the prophet, who insisted his brand new Islam confirmed 2,000-year-old Judaism, said, Ishak, Moses commanded them to prostrate themselves, and his Lord spoke to him, and they heard his voice giving them commands and prohibitions, so that they understood what they heard. But when Moses went back to the Jews, a party of them changed the commandments they had been given. This became Quran 2.75. As you might expect, Muhammad didn't bother explaining what the commands originally proclaimed, which of the ten the party changed, how they corrupted them, why they bothered, or how they could have gotten away with the most monumental edit of all time. Muhammad was certain his name and description were plastered throughout the Torah. He actually believed, if we can trust him, the covenant between the Jews and Yahweh pertained to him. His arguments were equal parts delusional and egotistical. The following conversation allegedly occurred between Muhammad's God and the Yathrib Jews. Ishak, have you no understanding? 
Why do you maintain that he is not a prophet, since you know that Allah has made a covenant with you that you should follow him? While he tells you that he is the prophet whom you are expecting, and that you will find him in our book, you oppose him and do not recognize him. You reject his prophethood on mere opinion. Yep, and that became Quran 2.77. But if this is true, if Allah spoke to the Yathrib Jews, why did he speak to the Muslims? And since Allah alleges that he wrote the Torah, why didn't he tell the Jews where to look for the descriptions of his Arab prophet? All this verse actually proves is that Muhammad claimed to be the Messiah. The next hadith explains how Muhammad came to speak about Yahweh's 7,000-year plan. Ishaq, the apostle came to Medina when the Jews were saying the world would last 7,000 years and that God would only punish men in hell one day for every thousand. Allah sent down, and they say the fire will not touch us except for a few days. So they became the people of hell, where they will live forever. And that became Quran 280. Like everything Muhammad stole from the Bible, he was right up to the point of departure. By putting Yahweh's prophetic calendar together, one discovers that seven distinct 1,000-year periods follow the fall of Adam. There is no reference to hellish days, however, and Muhammad misstated himself in the mix, wrongly predicting that the world would end in the year 1110 A.D. Sadly, our calendar is as pagan as Islam's, but I can pinpoint where we are in this chronology. There is considerable reason to believe that the sixth 1,000-year period will end during the Feast of Tabernacles in 2033, following seven years of extreme tribulation at the hands of Satan and Islam. Showing that Allah didn't know the difference between a covenant and a command, Muhammad claims he said, Ishaq, we made a covenant with the children of Israel, which is your covenant. Worship none but Allah. Show kindness to parents, near relatives, and orphans. Speak kindly to men, establish obligatory prayer, and pay the zakat. Quran 2.80 The Bible speaks of seven covenants. They are relationships, not commandments. Some are unilateral, including the one Islam claims to be modeled after, the covenant with Abraham. In it, Yahweh made promises, but asked for nothing in return. The renewed covenant, first presented by Jeremiah and fulfilled by Yeshua, is also unilateral. Yahweh promises salvation, eternity with Him. All we can do is accept His gift. Islam's five pillars, which are hinted at here, are commandments, not agreements or relationships. Allah makes no promises. Further, there was never a worship none but Allah, speak kindly, prostration prayer, or zakat tax agreement, covenant or commandment in the Bible, projecting his faults on his opponents, and in this case the Jews, speaking unkindly of them and killing their parents, was something Muhammad did with great regularity. He would soon violate all of these commandments, as he had wrongly called covenants. Although we are still in the same paragraph, it appears that Allah is now speaking to the Jews. Ishaq, when we made a covenant with you saying, Shed not your blood and do not turn people out of their dwellings, you ratified it. Yet you take prisoners and ransom them and expel people, although it is forbidden in your religion. Allah cursed them for their unbelief. When a scripture comes to them from Allah, confirming what they already have, they deny it. Allah's curse is on them. Quran 2.82 The Jews did none of these things. Muhammad did them all. The following hadith is one of many that show Muhammad tried to pass himself off as the Messiah. Ishaq In the pagan era, the Jews were scripture folk, and we were pagans. They used to say, Soon a prophet will be sent whom we shall follow. When Allah sent his apostle from the Quraysh, and we followed him, they denied him. Allah revealed, when there comes to him one they recognize, they deny him. They are wretched, so Allah cursed them, and he will give them a shameful punishment. 
The double anger is his wrath because they have disregarded the Torah and anger because they have disbelieved his prophet whom Allah has sent to them. This nonsense is from Quran 289. The false prophet was as similar to the Antichrist and as dissimilar to the Messiah as any man who has ever lived. There is nothing Muhammad wanted more than for the Jews to proclaim that he was the Messiah. And when they didn't, for a thousand obvious reasons, he turned his wrath upon them. Ishak, long for death, you Jews. If you are truthful, pray that God will kill whichever one of us is the most false. The Jews refused the prophet's dare. Not only is this childish, it's damning. The point of contention was whether Muhammad was the Messiah, or at least a prophet sent by God. The Jews and the Bible said, No. Muhammad in his Quran said, Yes. So he dared the Jews to have God kill the biggest liar. Allah said to his prophet, They will never accept your dare because of their past deeds, but they recognize you from the knowledge they have. Yet they deny. Had they accepted your dare, not a single Jew would have remained alive on the earth. Yes, this became Quran 2.94. Muhammad wanted the Jews to accept something he believed would have led to their annihilation. He wanted them wiped out to the last, every Jew dead. So did his God. Quran 8, verse 7. Allah wished to confirm the truth by his words, wipe the unbelievers out to the last. Total genocide. The paragraph ends with, Ishak, we will not remove a Jew from the punishment. The Jew knows the shameful things that await him in the next life because he has wasted the knowledge he has. Quran 2, 96. Tabari? Bukhari and Ishak all chronicle a variety of tests Jewish rabbis allegedly put Muhammad through to determine whether or not he was a prophet, speaking on the authority of God as he claimed. They are dated to different times and include some repetitive material. While there is no chance these discussions occurred as they are reported, Muhammad's answers are revealing. Ishak Jewish rabbis came to the apostle and asked him to answer four questions, saying, If you do so, we will follow you, testify to your truth, and believe in you. They began, Why does a boy resemble its mother when the semen comes from the father? Muhammad replied, Do you not know that a man's semen is white and thick, and a woman's is yellow and thin? The likeness goes with that which comes to the top. Agreed, the rabbis proclaimed. First, only a complete imbecile would believe that Jewish rabbis, students of the Torah, would test a prophet's credentials in such a moronic fashion, much less concede that he was right. Second, he was wrong. Third, this answer contradicts his earlier testimony, in which he claimed that likenesses were based upon who discharged first. Question. Tell us about your sleep. Answer. Do you not know that a sleep which you allege I do not have is when the eye sleeps, but the heart is awake? Question. Tell us about what Israel, that would be Jacob, voluntarily forbade himself. Answer. Do you not know that the food he loved best was the flesh and milk of camels, or perhaps two lobes of liver, kidneys, and fat? Question. Tell us about the spirit. Answer. Do you not know that it is Gabriel, he who comes to me? Agreed, the rabbi said, but Muhammad, your spirit is an enemy to us. An angel comes to you only with violence and the shedding of blood, and were it not for that, we would follow you. Anyone familiar with the Bible, and that would include these Jews, would have instantly recognized Muhammad's spirit as that of the fallen angel, Halal bin Shakar, Satan. The description is a perfect fit. Allah even speaks of Satan in the same paragraph. So Allah sent down concerning them, when the apostle comes to them from Allah confirming that which they have received in Scripture, they put it behind their backs as if they did not know it. They follow that which Satan read concerning the kingdom of Solomon, sorcery. One of the rabbis said, Don't you wonder at Muhammad? He alleges that Solomon was a prophet and yet he was nothing but a sorcerer. So Allah sent down, 
Solomon did not disbelieve, but Satan did, practicing sorcery. This became Quran 2.101. According to Muhammad and Allah, the Jews read scripture dictated by Satan. Since Allah claims he dictated Jewish scriptures, we have finally been introduced. Ishak, the apostle wrote a letter to the Jews of Kabar before he annihilated them. In the name of Allah, Arachman, Aramin, from Muhammad the Apostle of Allah, friend and brother of Moses, who confirms what Moses brought, that being the Torah, Allah says to you, O scripture folk, you will find it in your scripture, Muhammad is the Apostle of Allah. Those with him are severe against the unbelievers. You see them bowing, falling prostrate, seeking bounty and acceptance. The mark of their prostrations is on their foreheads. That is their likeness in the Torah and in the Gospels. While the mark of the beast is in the Bible, it only serves to prove that Islam is satanic. As for finding, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. Those with him are severe against the unbelievers. Written in the Torah and Gospels, I'll become a Muslim and worship Satan the moment someone shows me where. The Hadith continues. Ishak, do you find in what he sent down to you that you should believe in Muhammad? If you do not find that in your scripture, then there is no compulsion upon you. The right path has been plainly distinguished from error. Quran 2, 257. So I call you to Allah and his prophet. Someone sold this sorry sack a bag of manure. But thankfully, since Muhammad cannot be found in my scripture, there is no compulsion for me or anyone else to serve Satan. Ishak, the Jews used to ask Muhammad questions which annoyed and confused him. Ishak, your situation seems obscure to us, Muhammad. And it remains so. But Team Islam was undeterred. Ishak, O Jews, fear Allah and submit, for you used to hope for the Messiah's help against the Arabs when we were pagans. You told us that he would be sent, and then told us about him. A Jew responded, Muhammad has not shown us anything we recognize as prophetic. He is not the one we spoke to you about. So Allah revealed, We confirmed what they had, and we sent one they recognized, but they rejected him, so we are cursing them. The Jews replied, No covenant was ever made with us about Muhammad. Then turning to face their tormentor, the Medina Jews said, Muhammad, you have not brought anything we recognize, and God has not sent down any sign or miracle suggesting we should believe you. So Allah said, We have sent down to you plain signs, and only evil doers disbelieve them. The truth hurts. Neither prophet nor God knew how to respond to this scathing indictment. Ishak, the Jews told Allah's messenger, Bring us a book, bring us something down from heaven that we might read it. After all of this whining and anti-Semitism, Muhammad still didn't have a book. Nothing had been written down, much less collated into scripture. Not only couldn't our boy find a prophecy pointing to himself, not only couldn't he perform a miracle, he couldn't even produce a book. But alas, he couldn't have read it if he had. Ishak, the Jews used to turn men away from Islam, so Allah said, The scripture folk wish to make you unbelievers after you have believed. They are envious. But be indulgent until Allah gives you his orders. To rob them, rape them, and sell them into slavery, and of course murder them which is precisely what he would order them to do in Quran 33:25. Muslims had this right, although not in the way they imagined. Ishak, two arms, two arms, the Muslims said, quarreling and boasting among themselves. When this reached the prophet, he said, Muslims, will you act as pagans while I am with you? They realized their dissension was due to Satan and the guile of their enemy. Then they went off with the apostle, attentive and obedient. Like Hitler after him, the anti-Semitic prophet wanted to be sure no one would befriend a Jew. He had plans for them. Ishak, some Muslims remained friends with the Jews, so Allah sent down a Quran forbidding them to take the Jews as friends. 
From their mouths, hatred has already shown itself, and what they conceal is worse. An enemy must be isolated and vilified to be conquered. So Mohammed said, You believe in their book, though you don't have a clue as to what it says, while they deny your book, so you have more right to hate them than they have to hate you. Ishak, Abu Bakr went to a Jewish school. There is no mention of him ever going to a Muslim school. And found many pupils gathered around Finhas, a learned rabbi. Bakr told the Jews to fear Allah and submit. He told them that they would find Muhammad was an apostle, written in the Torah and Gospels. Muhammad's lead general was so unaware, he told Jews to look for prophetic confirmation of Muhammad in the Christian Gospels. These boys were dumb. Finhas replied, We are rich compared to Allah. We do not humble ourselves to Allah. Read Satan. He humbles himself to us. We are independent of him while he needs us. Why does your God ask us to lend him money, as your master pretends? Bakr was enraged and hit Finnis hard in the face. For telling him the truth. Were it not for the treaty between us, I would cut off your head, you enemy of Allah. So Allah, actually Satan, said, They will taste our punishment of burning. Which is confirmed in Quran 2, 7, 11, 24, 27, 39, 81, 85 to 90, 96, 104, 114, 119, 126, 162, 165, 174, 196, 201, 206, 211, 217, 257, and 275. Muhammad's spirit hated Jews. Ishak, Allah revealed concerning Finhas and the other rabbis. Allah issued orders to those who had received the book. He's speaking of the Torah. You are to make it clear to men and not conceal it, yet they cast the Torah behind their backs and sold it for a small price. Wretched was their exchange. They will therefore receive a painful punishment. While the Quran complains about the Jews selling Muhammad Bible stories a dozen times or more, this is the most direct confession in the Hadith. Next, Muhammad puts the caravan before the camel. Ishak, the Torah confirms what Muhammad brought. Then, Rifa'ah, a noble Jew, spoke to the apostle, twisting his tongue. Give us your attention, Muhammad, so that we can make you understand. Then he attacked Islam and reviled it. So Allah sent down, Allah knows about your enemies. Some of the Jews change words from their contexts and say, we hear and disobey, twisting their tongues and attacking the religion. But Allah cursed them. This became Quran 2.59 and 4.47. One has to be ignorant or oblivious not to condemn this stuff. Ishak, the Jewish rabbis knew that Muhammad had brought them the truth, but they denied that they knew it. They were obstinate. So Allah revealed, people of the book Believe in what we sent down in confirmation of what you have been given before, or we will efface your features and turn your face into your ass, cursing you. Allah was such a loving and nurturing spirit. The Jews said, Ishak, tell us when the day of doom will be, Muhammad, if you are a prophet as you say. So Allah sent down, They will ask you about the hour when it will come to pass. Say, only my Lord knows of it. None but he will reveal it at its proper time. Say, only Allah knows about it, but most men do not know. In other words, neither Muhammad nor Allah were prophets. And since the mighty Mo claimed to be the last messenger, who was going to share Allah's big surprise? How can we follow you, Muhammad, when you have abandoned our quibla? And do you not allege that Uzair is the son of God? So Allah revealed... The Jews say that Uzair is the Son of God. No, they don't. And the Christians say that the Messiah is the Son of God. That is what they say with their mouths, copying the speech of those who disbelieved in the earlier times. Allah, fight them! How perverse are they! That's so stupid. I'm speechless. Trying to reason with this man, the Jews said, Ishak, for our part, 
we don't see how your Quran's recitals are arranged anything like our Torah's. So Muhammad, who couldn't read, said, You know quite well that the Quran is from Allah. You will find it written in the Torah, which you have. <laughs> Sorry, you won't find any mention of the Quran in the Torah. Not in the original from 1200 B.C., not in the Septuagint from 275 B.C., not in the Dead Sea Scrolls dating from 250 B.C. to 70 A.D., not in the Torah, which they had in 625 A.D., nor in one from 2005. Since the most important and oft-repeated claim in Muhammad's prophetic career was false, Muhammad was a false prophet. It's as simple as that. Yet the charlatan bragged, Eshach, if men and jinn, that would be demons, came together to produce its like, they could not. Finhas said, did men or jinn tell you this, Muhammad? The answer was yes to both, but he said, You know full well that the Quran is from Allah, and that I am the apostle of Allah. You will find it written in the Torah you have. The rabbi replied, When God sends a prophet, he provides for him. So bring us a book that is divinely inspired, that we may read it and determine if you are telling the truth. We can produce our book, Unable to produce so much as a single chapter, Muhammad and his God retreated to the state of denial, their most familiar territory. So Allah revealed concerning their words, Say, though men and jinn should meet to produce this Quran, they would not produce its like, even working together. Let's see if Allah is right. The second surah begins with a contradiction. Quran 2 verse 1 Alif Lam Min Following Alif, Lam, Min, the translators added in parentheses, These letters are a miracle of the Quran, and only Allah knows what they mean. This is the book free of doubt, a guidance to those who ward off evil, who believe in the unknown, fulfill their devotional obligations, and pay the zakat out of what we have provided. There is no doubt these uninspired rantings have guided more evil than they have warded off. Allah's book is asking people to believe in the unknown, unable to produce a miracle, prophecy, or even a sane depiction of God. Muhammad just gives up and says, Believe in the unknown. We're 91 surahs into the Quran, and what little is known about the spirit is demonic. He spends his days tormenting unbelievers in hell. He spends his nights leading believers astray. He supports immorality when it serves his prophet's interests. And he doesn't want his true identity to be known. But the dark spirit wants to be worshipped. The passage defines Muslims as those who fulfill their devotional obligations. Although this may sound pious, it's wrong too. Devotion and obligation are incompatible, mutually exclusive concepts. Devotion, love, requires choice. The lack of choice is Islam's greatest deficiency, as the word obligation suggests. That brings us to the zakat, the tax imposed on all Muslims. It's one of the five pillars. Islam gives monetary confiscation a politically correct veneer by calling it charity, the giving of alms. But Muhammad used it exactly like politicians use taxes. At sword point, he took money from productive people so that he could bribe his unproductive supporters. It made Muhammad powerful and Muslims dependent. It's no different from the tactics Saddam Hussein used to ensure Ba'ath Party loyalty. Quran 2 verse 4 Whoever believes in the Quran and Sunnah, which has been sent down to you, Muhammad, and in that which was sent to those before your time, the Torah and the Gospel, have the assurance of the hereafter. Although there are a thousand reasons to discard the Quran, this one is as good as they come. Allah is taking credit for prior scripture, saying that it should also be believed. Since the Quran and Torah are irreconcilably different, this order is impossible. It's like telling someone to be a democratic capitalist and a totalitarian communist all at the same time. Quran 2 verse 6 
As for the disbelievers, it is the same whether you warn them or not. They will not believe. Allah has set a seal upon their hearts, upon their hearing, and a covering over their eyes. There is a great torment for them. It's another Islamic first. A spirit so perverse, so evil, he precludes people from knowing him. And he does it so that he can torture them. The concept is demonic. The words are satanic. The next thirteen verses rekindle the never-ending argument. Only this time the victims are Jews, not Arabs. Quran 2 verse 9. They deceive Allah and those who believe, but they only deceive themselves and realize it not. In their hearts is a disease, and Allah has increased their disease. Grievous is the painful doom they incur because they lie. Only in Islam could man deceive God. But that's child's play compared to a God who calls men diseased, and then, rather than curing them, makes them sicker. The Quran begins as badly as it ends. Quran 2 verse 11 when it is said to them, Make not mischief on the earth, they say, We are peacemakers only. Propagandists and political strategists know that the most effective deception is one that projects a doctrine's or candidate's faults onto their rivals. That is precisely what is being done here. The mischief makers are Muslims, not Jews. As proof, the Jews were tending to their own business, while the Muslims were out pirating. But it is the last line that haunts us today. In the face of worldwide Islamic terror, Muslims say, We are peacemakers only. And we believe them. Shame on us. Still attacking Jews, the Quran says, They are mischief mongers, but they realize not. When it is said to them, Believe as the others believe, they say, Shall we believe as the fools? Nay, surely they are the fools, but they know not. When they meet the faithful, they say, We believe. But when they are alone with the devils, they say, We are really with you. We were only mocking. Obviously, it didn't take the Jews long to assess the merits of Islam. Knowing who God is helped them recognize who he was not. And therein lies our problem. We have lost sight of Yahweh. Having separated ourselves from him, most don't even know his name, much less his character or plan. Not knowing Yahweh makes Satan more deceptive. For example, this is Satan speaking, not God. Quran 2 verse 15 Allah mocks them, paying them back, increasing their wrongdoings, so they wander blindly. Then the devil says, these are they who have bartered guidance for error, and have gained nothing from the deal. Another translation reads, These are they who purchase error at the price of guidance, so their bargain shall bring no gain. This is Allah's first attempt at condemning Jews for selling, not giving, their oral traditions to Muhammad. He is inferring that his bastardized accounts, the ones twisted to make his immoral behavior look divine, are true guidance why the originals are erroneous. Remember, people believed Hitler's lies, too, lies that were indistinguishable from Islam. Working for the same master, they were equally seductive, racist, demonic, and destructive. Quran 2, verse 17. They are like one who kindled a fire. When it burned around him, Allah took away their light and left them in darkness, so they could not see. They are deaf, dumb, and blind, so they return not. Or like a storm with darkness, thunder and lightning. They thrust their fingers in their ears for fear of death, but Allah surrounds the disbelievers. The lightning snatches away their eyes. When darkness covers them, they stand still, and if Allah pleased, he would take away their hearing too. Allah is harming men, not condemning doctrines, and the dark spirit is shown thwarting man's effort to know him which is probably a good thing. After a series of proofs, Allah says, Quran 2, verse 23, If you are in doubt of what we have revealed to our votary, then bring a surah like this, and call any witnesses apart from Allah. But you cannot, as indeed you cannot guard yourselves against the hell fire, whose fuel is men and rocks, 
which have been prepared for the infidels. Dr. Seuss writes better sonnets than this. They are original, instructive, nurturing, and chronological. So I call the Grinch to witness. He is no less real, and he's a lot less disturbed. I'm going to skip the debate between Allah, Adam, and Satan, as we have played the Can You Name the Animals game before. It ends with a clever impersonation, however, with Adam playing Muhammad. Quran 2, verse 39. Those who reject our signs will be inmates of the hell fire and will abide there forever. Proving that the Quran was as crazy as its God, the book that just invested the better part of 40 verses condemning Jews to hell, telling them that they were deaf, dumb, blind, diseased, and led astray, now says, Quran 2, verse 40. O children of Israel, remember the favors I bestowed on you. So keep my covenants, so that I fulfill your covenant. Fear me, and believe in what I sent down, confirming and verifying the scripture which you possess already. This confirms that Islam is irrational. Q cannot verify B if Q condemns and contradicts B. Further, if B is true and Q opposes B, then Q must be false. While an irrational God is a problem for Islam, there is a bigger issue. Quran 2.41 Be not the first to deny or sell my verses for a small price, and fear me and me alone. Another translation reads, Part not with my revelations for a trifling price, getting a small gain by selling my verses. The Quran just confirmed that Muhammad bought his divine revelation from the Jews. It wasn't handed down. It wasn't deciphered from clanging bells or dictated by Gabriel. It was purchased in a business transaction. Quran 2, verse 42. Do not mix truth with falsehood, nor conceal the truth when you know. The truth is, all doctrines based on fear and submission are bad. They are designed to empower the few, so that they might fleece the many. Almost 3,000 years ago, the Jews substituted a powerful and nurturing relationship with Yahweh for a complex and stifling religion. The religion was good for cleric and king, but devastating for the Jewish people, separating them from their land and from God. The Catholic Church did the same thing, elevating rites and rituals above relationship. It was great for cleric and king, but devastating for humankind. Likewise, Islam offers nothing to men but false hope of a twisted paradise. It uses fear to suppress and stupefy the masses, enriching and empowering imams and tyrants alike. Islam, more than any doctrine conceived by man, uses mind-numbing ritual and senseless rites to manipulate and fleece the flock. Islamic prayer is not a conversation with God. It's a performance to be acted out. Islamic worship isn't heartfelt praise. It's mindless, obligatory, and repetitive. The Quran is not to be questioned or understood. It is to be obeyed. The Islamic God is unknown for a reason. He is repulsive. Chairman Muhammad was ordering the Jews to capitulate to him, but they saw right through his act. Quran 2, verse 43. Perform prayer. Pay the zakat tax. Bow down and prostrate yourself with our rakiyun, the obedient bowers. You read, recite, and study the scripture. Why don't you understand? Why don't you capitulate? Nay, seek Islamic prostration. Prayer. It is indeed hard, heavy, and exacting, except for those who obey in submission. In other words, become Muslims and subject yourselves to my obligations because I need to control you and I covet your money. Allah, the God who said he turns Jews into swine and apes, claims, in Quran 2, verse 47, Remember, children of Israel, the favor which I bestowed on you, and made you exalted among the nations of the world, preferring you to men and jinn. But then, in verse 59, the Jewish transgressors changed and perverted the word from that which had been spoken to them to a word distorted. So we sent a plague upon them from heaven for all their evil doing. The God of favors bestowed a plague from heaven. 
Bukhari. Allah's apostle said, plague was a means of torture sent on the Israelis. While we differ on plagues being heavenly, bigger questions remain. When, how, and why did the Bible get so distorted that it became the opposite of the Quran? The claim is the crux of Islam, yet no Muslim cleric, prophet, or God ever provided a rational explanation, and without an answer, Islam is a counterfeit, a lousy job of plagiarizing, nothing more. The Septuagint and Dead Sea Scrolls irrefutably prove that the Torah has remained unchanged since at least 250 B.C., a thousand years before the Quran was written. Since Islam claims otherwise, it's a fraud, not a religion. Not only is there a mountain of historical evidence to refute Muhammad's claim, reason alone will suffice. For the Jews to have written Allah, Muhammad, Mecca, the Kaaba, appeasement, Arabic, Islam, tax, jihad, submit, religion, Muslim, and the five pillars out of the Torah, and Yahweh, the Messiah, Jerusalem, the Temple, Atonement, Hebrew, Judaism, tithe, love, choose, relationship, Jews, and the Ten Commandments in, requires a conspiracy infinitely beyond anything the world has ever known. A total suspension of rational thought is required to believe Allah. And then there is the little problem of motivation. Why would the nation of Israel collectively and comprehensively alter the totality of their scriptures and history in an attempt to foil a con man a thousand miles away and a thousand years distant? The dark spirit of Islam has sent a plague from his abode, and it has consumed men's minds. Hopefully there will be enough healthy neurons left for Muslims to make wise choices once they are exercised from this pestilence. Quran 2 verse 61 Humiliation and wretchedness were stamped upon the Jews and they were visited with wrath from Allah. That was because they disbelieved Allah's proofs, signs and verses and killed the prophets. They disobeyed and rebelled, surely those who believe. And Jews, the Nazareans, those would be Christians. And the Sabaeans, those would be Zoroastrians. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, and whoever does right, shall have his reward with the Lord, and will neither have fear nor regret. Muslims quote the last part of this verse to the media to demonstrate how tolerant Islam is. Yet they must take it out of context. The prior verse says that Allah stamped the Jews with wretchedness and that his wrath was justified. Further, Muslims must mistranslate it too, replacing the name Allah with the word God. The passage actually says, Tolerance is only extended if the Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians believe in Allah and become Muslims. Either convert or fear and regret it. Two verses later, the intolerant Allah is back on the warpath, acting like a racist. Quran 2, verse 64. But you, that would be Jews, went back on your words and were lost losers. You know that you have broken the sanctity of the Sabbath. So we said, become monkeys, despised and hated. We made this punishment an example and a warning for those who fear Allah. Whether you choose to interpret this as God calling Jews despised apes, or turning them into hated monkeys, it isn't godly. And if the Sabbath was sanctified by Allah, why do Muslims ignore the warning and worship on Friday? The following hadith was designed to answer that question. Bukhari, the Prophet said, We, that would be Muslims, are the last to come, but we will be the foremost. Nations were given the scripture of the book before us, and we were given the holy book after them. Friday is the day about which they differed. So the next day, Saturday, was prescribed for the Jews, and the day after it, Sunday, for the Christians. It is incumbent upon every Muslim to wash his head and body on Friday. I would suppose that it would be too much to ask the Prophet to explain how a Friday dispute could have arisen between Jews and Christians, considering it was chiseled in stone 
twelve centuries before the first Christian was born. In the next fifteen verses, Allah bounces between arguing with Jews and regaling their history. Then he condemns them for overcharging Muhammad for erroneous Bible stories. Quran 2, verse 79. But woe to the Jews who fake the scriptures and say, This is from God, so that they might earn some profit thereby. And woe to them for what their hands have written, and woe to them for what they earn from it. What makes them fake is that the Bible accounts the Jews sold to Muhammad differed from the version the prophet twisted to serve his interests. Quran 2, verse 80. Yet they, the Jews, say, Fire will not touch us for more than a few days, but they are enclosed in error and are the inmates of hell. Failing to scare them, Muhammad ordered Jews to pay the zakat tax on your wealth for the welfare of others. That would be the welfare of Muslims, of course. And remember, we took your covenant. Shed not blood among us, or turn people out of their homes. You promised and bear witness, but you kill one another, call people guilty, and use oppression. When captives are brought, you ransom them, although it was forbidden. The Yathrib Jews did none of these things. The Muslims did them all. They shed blood murdering thousands. They forced thousands more from their homes. Their God condemned men, and their prophet founded the most oppressive regime ever conceived. During the month these situational scriptures were contrived, Muhammad personally took captives and ransomed them. Even if you don't see Muhammad as the Meccans and the Jews saw him, as an insane, demon-possessed liar, forging scriptures for his own selfish gain, it's hard to miss the fact that he was a total hypocrite. It's amazing how much difference a year and a few miles can make. In the last Meccan surah, Allah was congratulating the Jews for testifying to the truth of his Quran. Now they're going to roast in hell for not swallowing it whole. Quran 2, verse 85. Do you, Jews, believe a part of the book and reject a part? There is no reward for them who so act but disgrace in the world, and on the day of doom, the severest of punishment, their torment will never decrease. The more one is exposed to Muhammad's poisonous brew, the worse it tastes. As we move on, Yeshua is brought back into the fray, and we're told that the Gospels and Torah are divinely inspired. But then we learn that Allah has cursed Christians and Jews for their disbelief. Allah's anti-Christian, anti-Jew diatribe continues for 50 verses. The same Allah who refers to himself as we and our claims that Yeshua cannot be his son because he is one. Allah's racist rant includes the 20th rendition of Quran 2 verse 89. The Quran book was sent down to them, the Jews, by Allah verifying and confirming what had been revealed to them already, the Torah and Gospels. They used to pray for victory over the unbelievers, and even though they recognized it when it came to them, they renounced it. The curse of Allah be on them who deny. By slipping out of first person to curse the Jews, Muhammad has lifted the veil and shown us who is really behind the curtain. We are three-quarters of the way through the Quran, and yet this is the first time Gabriel, the messenger's messenger, is named. Quran 2, verse 97. Say, Muhammad, whoever is an enemy to Gabriel, for he brings it down to your heart by Allah's leave, a confirmation of what was revealed before, and guidance, and glad tidings for those who believe, Whoever is an enemy to Allah, his angels, his messengers, to Gabriel and Michael, lo, Allah himself is an enemy of the disbelievers. The spirit who terrorized Muhammad in the cave is now given a name, and would you know it, his name is from the Bible too. Allah seems to have a very limited imagination, and a limited range of emotions. The moment we meet the heavenly caste, they are off to war, condemning their enemies for rejecting their doctrine of submission. Every word of this reeks of Satan, the real enemy of the Jews. Quran 2, verse 99. 
we have sent down to you manifest signs, and none reject them but those who are perverse. How, pray tell, can a doctrine be tolerant when its spiritual leader says that all who reject his claims are perverse? And you think that if Allah were going to brag about all of his signs, he would perform one, one lousy miracle. Making the blind lame or the deaf dumb doesn't count. Muhammad and Allah only promise and protest. They are more like Hitler and Goebbels than prophet and God. Once again, Quran 2, verse 101. When there came a messenger from Allah confirming what was with them, a party of the people of the Torah and Gospel, the scripture book, fling away the book of Allah, tossing it behind their backs, as if they did not know. You've probably noticed a pattern in the Quran. The things Muhammad and Allah protest most, they are most guilty of. They claim repeatedly that the Quran confirms the scripture it twists. Similar verbose assertions are, The Quran was a book. Allah created man. Allah showed his signs. Jews were Muslims. And Muhammad wasn't a demon-possessed madman. Quran 2, verse 102. They follow what Satan chanted and gave out during the lifetime of Solomon. Though Solomon never disbelieved, the devils denied and taught sorcery to men, which they said had been revealed to the angels of Babylon. Harut and Marut. However, these two angels never taught without saying, We have been sent to deceive you. Harut and Marut are Persian names, not Hebrew or Arabic. And while the implication is that the Jewish king Solomon was a Muslim during the time the Jews were influenced by the Babylonians, Allah's timeline is errant by 400 years. While well, that's indicting, What's really incriminating is Allah's claim that the Torah was inspired by the devil, and yet his Quran verifies its message. This, ever so appropriately, is followed by three repetitions of, If only they had sense. Now that the Jews had been properly chastised, it was time to get down to business. Muhammad had a tenuous grip on his fledgling community, and that just wouldn't do. Tyrants require unquestioned obedience total submission. Quran 2 verse 104 You of the Islamic faith say not to the prophet words of ambiguous report like listen to us but words of respect and obey him to those who don't submit there is a grievous punishment. While there are countless verses that confirm that Islam was invented to serve Muhammad this is as effective as any. The order was to respect and obey him. That would be Mohammed. This brings us to one of the Quran's biggest problems, Allah's contradictions. Mohammed wants us to believe that the creator of the universe is capricious and unreliable, changing his mind by canceling prior truths and obliterating his divine revelations. Quran 2 verse 106 When we cancel a verse or throw it into oblivion, we replace it with a better one. Or, whatever revelation we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we substitute something better. In the context of God, this is senseless. But in the context of a forgetful man trying to counterfeit the written record of God to serve his personal agenda, it's perfect. The religion of Islam failed in Mecca. Muhammad had to cast it into oblivion, to abrogate it, to move on with the doctrine of politics and submission. Allah replaces our Rahman. Piracy replaces inheritance. Jews replace Meccans. Swords replace words. Muslims replace everybody. And Muhammad gets what he wants. Money, women, and power. The reason the abrogation verse is so important is that it wipes out Islam as a religion. The first ninety surahs are cast into oblivion. The prophet has a new quibla and a political doctrine built upon submission and sword. But as bad as that sounds, you don't know the half of it yet. The last two dozen surahs are by far the worst. They contain some of the most immoral, hateful, violent, intolerant words ever spoken by man. Returning to the second edition of the never-ending argument, we are told that the non-proselyzing Jews were evangelizing. Quran 2, verse 109. 
quite a number of the people of the book wish they could turn you Muslim people back to infidelity after you have believed. That would actually be submitted. Through selfish envy, even after the truth has become manifest to them, indulge them until Allah issues his orders. The first part is funny. The second part is not. Jews, who were employed, prosperous and literate, who possessed the longest surviving and best documented monotheistic face in the world, were jealous of Mohammed's band of bandits? I don't think so. But what's sinister is Allah's ultimate order to exile and murder them. Within a mere six months, Mohammed would perpetrate a horrible crime. That said, it was back to business. Mohammed needed some more rituals and taxes. They became his means of suppression and oppression. Quran 2, verse 110. Establish worship, ritual prayer, and pay the zakat tax. Whatever good you send before your souls, you will find with Allah. Surely Allah sees what you do. Pay now, or receive later. Then it was back to the never-ending argument. Quran 2, verse 111. They say none shall enter paradise unless he be a Jew or Christian. Those are their vain desires. Say, produce your proof if you are truthful. Nay, the tolerant religion said, whoever submits his face to Allah and surrenders, he will get his reward. On such shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. The Jews say, the Christians follow nothing, and the Christians say, the Jews follow nothing true. Yet they profess to recite the same scripture book, but Allah will judge between them in their quarrel. By the seventh century, Jews had long since stopped criticizing Christians, and Jews only read out of half of the book. Moreover, Christians believe every word of the Hebrew scriptures. So once again, Allah has his facts entirely wrong. Finished with the Christians and Jews for the moment, it was time for Allah to take a swipe at the Meccans once again. Quran 2, verse 114. And who is more unjust than he who forbids Allah's name to be celebrated and mentioned in the sanctuary places, the mosque, and strives for their ruin? It was not fitting that such should enter them, except in fear. For there is nothing but disgrace in this world, and in the next an exceeding torment, an awful doom. This is Muhammad's feeble attempt to justify his new career path as pirate, kidnapper, and murderer. Terrorism is justified because the Meccans shooed me away from Allah's house. And while that's as lame as it is immoral, the verse is not without a pearl. If Allah's name should be celebrated, then Allah is a name and not a word. In other words, Allah cannot be both the Arabic word for God and the name of its God at the same time. That would be like naming your pet dog, Dog. Since Dog is God backwards, maybe we've stumbled onto something. Now that Dog has bared its fangs, at the Meccans it's time to bite Christians. Quran 2, verse 116. They say, Allah hath begotten a son, glory be to him. Nay, to him belongs all that is in the heavens and on the earth. All are subservient and obedient to him. It's all right to say, Allah has daughters if there's a buck in it. But heaven forbid you should say that Christ is the Son of God. To him is due the primal origin of the heavens and earth. When he decrees a matter, he says to it, Be, and it is. It's a good thing that contradictions are abrogated in the Quran, or this would be a problem. Everything the Quran says Allah created, including the earth, Adam, and Jesus, were made in the same manner, a manner other than saying, be, and it is. In an earlier chapter, the Islamic Abraham introduced us to the second surah, starting with the 118th verse. Allah lured Abraham out of Israel, the land flowing with milk and honey, into the wastelands of Arabia, to make the pagan Kaaba appear monotheistic. The Quran, however, was not as daring as the Hadith. It made no attempt to explain how or why a hundred-year-old man crossed a thousand miles of desert with an illegitimate infant and a slave girl to reach a place that wouldn't be inhabited for twenty-five centuries. In a long-winded speech, Allah said that Abraham and his Jewish kin were Muslims practicing Islam. Quran 2, verse 132. 
And this was the legacy that Abraham left to his sons by Yacoub. O oh, my sons, Allah has chosen the faith for you, the true religion. Then die not except in the faith of Islam as Muslims. He said to his sons, What will you worship after me? They said, We will worship your Ilah, or God, the Ilah of your fathers, of Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac, the one Ilah. To him we submit in Islam. It's a wonder such an important profession of faith eluded the Hebrew prophets. Nowhere in the Bible are the words Muslim, Muhammad, Allah, or Islam written. It's inconceivable that Abraham could have had such a fine religion and not even mention it or his pal Allah. We also covered Allah's admission in the 138th verse that he was a Baptist. This was followed by Allah's delusional claim that he was Yahweh. Starting at the 142nd verse, Allah tells us that Muslims should no longer play with the Christians and Jews. They must now recognize the monotheistic holiness of Allah's pagan shrine, the rock pile in Mecca. The Kaaba is called a sacred and holy mosque, even though the only actual mosque at this time served as Muhammad's brothel. The mosque in Medina was an open courtyard. The buildings that surrounded it served as apartments for Muhammad's wives, sex slaves, and concubines. And the shrine of which they spoke was still home to hundreds of rock idols, including Allah's black stone. Quran 2, verse 142. The fools among the people will say, What has turned them from their quibla, which they had? Say, The east and the west belong only to Allah. He guides whom he likes to the right path. Thus we have appointed you a medium nation, that you may be witnesses against mankind, that the messenger may be a witness against you. And we appointed the quibla which you had formerly observed, only that we might know him who follows the messenger, from him who turns on his heels. Muhammad had just arrived in Yathrib, and his foolish spirit was already calling the townsfolk fools. The one-time prophet termed profiteer had moved away from Allah's house in disgrace, following the satanic verses. He had changed his quibla to Jerusalem opportunistically, naively thinking the Jews would accept him as their Messiah. When they rejected him for the fool he was, his God told his co-conspirator, The Jews have rejected our bogus claims, so we're not going to play with them any more. Team Islam issued an about face. You probably noticed that the never-ending argument gained a larger antagonist. Muhammad and his dark spirit are now against mankind. What you may not have noticed, however, was the admission of failure. Muhammad needed a way to determine who was in lockstep with him, as he had been unable to secure a sufficient quantity of the Ansar helpers to go along with his new program. Not a single Ansar joined the pirates in any of the first dozen Muslim raids. Then, when the last one prevailed, ending in murder, theft, and kidnapping for ransom, they cried foul, since the raid breached their religious covenants. Madudi acknowledges Muhammad's problem in his commentary. During this period, a new type of Muslim, called the Munafulkin, or hypocrite, began to appear. They professed Islam, but were not prepared to abide by the consequences. There were some who had entered the Islamic fold merely to harm it from within. There were others who were surrounded by Muslims and therefore had become Muslims to safeguard their worldly interests. They knew good Muslims were terrorist thieves. So Muhammad came up with a plan to separate the hypocrites from his raiders. He had his dog bark. We had appointed the quibla, which you formerly observed, only that we might know him who follows the messenger from him who turns on his heels and doesn't submit. God knows all, so this cannot be God speaking. These words must therefore be Muhammad's. This was surely a hard test, except for those whom Allah has guided. And Allah was not going to make your faith fruitless and go to waste. Surely Allah is merciful. Since bowing south versus north isn't a test, we must read between the lines and assume Muhammad was testing Ansar and immigrant obedience. He needed to know whom he could count on to raid, terrorize, and plunder his enemies.
Quran 2, verse 144, We see the turning of your face. We shall now turn on you, a quibla that shall please you. Turn then your face in the direction of the sacred mosque at Mecca. Wherever you are, turn your faces in that direction. The people of the book, Jews and Christians, know well that the Kaaba is the truth from their Lord, nor is Allah unmindful of what they do. When God has to lie, there's a problem. If the Jews thought the Kaaba was godly, why did they pray facing the site of their former temple in Jerusalem? More importantly, why did Muhammad join them? Further, how could the Kaaba be sacred when it was a pagan shrine? Unable to perform miracles, the Prophet dismissed their significance. Quran 2 verse 145 Even if you were to bring the people of the scripture book all the signs, they would not follow your quibla, nor are you going to follow their quibla, nor indeed will they follow each other's quibla. This is another Allah oops. Christians never had a quibla, for Yahweh's spirit resides within us. Allah claims to have inspired the Gospels. He ought to have known that. If you, after knowledge has reached you, were to follow their vain desires, then were you indeed clearly in the wrong. Quran 2, verse 146. The people of the book unto whom we gave the scriptures know this revelation, as they know their own sons, but lo, a party of them knowingly conceals truth. Like all things made of man, the deeper one digs into the Quran, the more its flaws become apparent. Ponder the impossibility of the people of the book to whom we gave the scripture, believing every time the Bible referenced something happening in the land of Israel, in the city of Jerusalem, on Mount Moriah, or in the magnificent temple of Solomon, it was a purposeful deception. They would have to believe that it was possible for the thousands of events chronicled in the Bible to have actually occurred in Arabia, at a rock pile in a barren and deserted ravine, that a thousand years later would become a motley collection of mud huts called Mecca. They would have to believe that tens of millions of people conspired together over the course of two millennia to write the Jewish temple in and the Muslim Kaaba out of thousands of pages of the most meticulously maintained and broadly read and distributed scripture of all time. They would have to believe that Mohammed, the pirate of Medina, was actually talking with Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and telling the truth about what had happened in another place, in another time. It's so preposterous it begs the question, does anyone really believe Islam? Or, as Ishak and Madudi suggest, are they all hypocrites, merely going along to keep from losing their possessions and their lives? The translations that read, Recognize him, Muhammad, rather than, Know this, are equally outrageous. Muhammad is suggesting that the Jews of Yathrib recognize him as their Messiah, but were concealing the truth. Yet in truth, the Jews didn't even recognize Yeshua as their Messiah, and he fulfilled hundreds of exacting prophecies regarding his genealogy, birth, time, life, mission, death, and resurrection. Muhammad didn't fulfill one. So to say that the Jews recognized Muhammad's prophetic credentials as they recognized their own sons tells us a great deal about the mindset of the man. He was as delusional as he was egotistical. The next five verses wallow in the new quibla. The most important line warns the raiders not to fear the hypocrites. Quran 2 verse 150 Do not fear them, fear me. Motivating men to murder requires conditioning them to hate first. The intended victims must be dehumanized. Quran 2, 171 The semblance of the infidels is one who shouts to one who cannot hear. They are deaf, dumb, and blind. They make no sense. Quran 2, verse 174 Those who conceal Allah's revelation in the Bible, Scripture book, and thus make a miserable profit thereby, selling it to Muhammad, swallow fire into themselves. Allah will not address them. Grievous will be their doom. Since they're destined for hell anyway, 
Why not kill them? Quran 2, verse 175. They are the ones who bartered away guidance for the error and torment in place of forgiveness. Ah, what boldness they show for the fire. Their doom is because Allah has sent down the book in truth, but those who seek causes of dispute in the book are a schism of great opposition. Since this is written in code, or maybe just written badly, it provides the entire equation. It confirms that the Jews sold Muhammad the Bible stories he used to make himself look like a prophet. As we have discovered, Muhammad changed these to suit his agenda. Then, since the Quranic accounts were different, Muhammad accused his suppliers of selling him a faulty product. He said that B and Q were once identical, but that the Jews corrupted B so that they could argue with him about Q. Quran 2, verse 177. It is not piety that you turn your faces east or west, but it is the quality of one who believes in Allah and the last day, the angels, the book, and prophets, to spend your substance in spite of love for it, for Muhammad's kin, for orphans, for the wayfarer, Muhammad's mercenaries, for those who ask, and for the ransom of his captives, his POWs to be steadfast in devotional obligations and paying the zakat tax. Although two of Islam's five pillars are based upon the new Qibla, we are told here that it isn't pious, and while it may be a detail, Allah should have a better sense of direction. The old Qibla was north of Medina, and the new one was south. Neither were east and west. Further, as with the first attempts at religion in Mecca, the first try in Medina was centered on Muhammad. The Meccans who teased Muhammad and shooed him away from their pagan moon god shrine must now pay for their hate speech. He begins conditioning his faithful to believe retribution is good. Muhammad claims that Allah has told him that the mocking he suffered at the hands of his clan was so egregious that heads must roll. By verse 191, Allah has his war paint on, and continues to whoop it up through verse 210, commanding Muslims to attack and kill their brethren. The next verse is Muhammad's first stab at instituting a law. It's as barbaric as is his religion. Quran 2, verse 178. Retaliation is prescribed for you in the matter of the murdered, the free for free, slave for slave, and female for female and for him who is pardoned somewhat by his injured brother, then prosecution should be according to the payment of blood money. He who transgresses after this will have a painful doom. Quran 2, verse 185. Ramadan is the month the Quran was sent down as a guide to mankind, also as clear proof or signs for guidance and the criterion. So every one of you who is present during that month must spend it fasting. The only reason Muhammad wrestled with the cave demon during Ramadan was because it was the pagan practice of his people to observe the Tananuth rituals in Ramadan. Tananuth was based upon self-deprivation and fasting, and thus the idolatrous practice and holy month were incorporated into Islam. The Kaaba ink made a new pillar out of an old one. And you must magnify Allah. Say, Allah u Akbar, Allah is greater. Speaking of Islamic pillars being constructed from regurgitated paganism, Quran 2, verse 189. They ask you about the new moons. Say, they are but signs to mark fixed seasons in the affairs of men and for Hajj pilgrimage. The enlightened world had long since abandoned the lunar calendar for the solar one we use today. Rather than fixing seasons, the lunar calendar Muhammad's God was prescribing caused dates to float around the year. But Allah was the moon God, so Muslims were forever condemned to the lunacy of his ignorance. Muhammad was now ready to reveal the real reason behind his new Qibla. He wanted his militants to fight for what he coveted. Quran 2, verse 190 Fight in Allah's cause those who fight you, but do not transgress limits, for Allah likes not the transgressors. The translators of the Noble Quran added the following within parentheses inside of the Quranic text itself. They said, 
This is the first verse revealed in connection with jihad. It was supplemented by the ninth surah. Although this verse clearly orders Muslims to fight, the first of many such commands, Islamic apologists use this passage in the Western media to infer that Islamic fighting can only be defensive and moderate. Yet in context, this is not what it says. Just read the next verse. Quran 2 verse 191 and kill them wherever you find and catch them, and drive them out from where they have turned you out. For al-fitna, polytheism, disbelief, and oppression, is worse than slaughter. Slaying them, wherever you find and catch them, is clearly offensive, not defensive. So the prior verse has already been abrogated. And there is no moderation when one says that a belief, or even verbal abuse, is worse than slaughter. Fight them not at the sacred mosque until they fight you there. But if they fight you, kill them. Such is the reward of those who are unbelievers. This is nonsensical. It is not possible for the Muslims of Medina to be defensive fighters if they have marched to Mecca with their fighting gear. Quran 2 verse 192 But if they cease or desist, Allah is forgiving and merciful. That sounds nice until you realize what they must cease doing. One must desist from rebuking Muhammad's claims. In other words, they must become a Muslim to avoid slaughter. Remember, no one was fighting the Muslims when this was handed down, so they were the hunters. The Meccans were their prey. To be forgiven and not slaughtered, one had to bow in submission and pay the zakat. Quran 2 verse 193 and fight them until there is no more fitna or disbelief and religion is only for Allah but if they cease but if they cease or desist let there be no hostility except against infidel disbelievers Muslims have been ordered to fight until the only religion is Islam world conquest and even when they have overrun the world there shall be no safe haven for infidel disbelievers this verse is as clear as a swastika. Quran 2, 194 The prohibited month for the prohibited month, or so for all things prohibited, there is the law of retaliation. If anyone transgresses the prohibition against you, transgress likewise against him. But fear Allah and know that Allah is with the pious. That was verbal diarrhea. So let's try another translation. The forbidden month for the forbidden month, and forbidden things in retaliation. And one who attacketh you, attack him in like manner as he attacked you. Observe your duty to Allah, and know that Allah is with those who ward off evil. That was worse. There was no hint of restraint. Maybe a third translation will clear up Allah's golden rule. The sacred month for the sacred month, and all sacred things are retaliation. Whoever then acts aggressively against you, inflict injury on him according to the injury he has afflicted on you. The problem isn't with the translators. Remember Muhammad's problem? His henchmen murdered, robbed, and kidnapped in the pagan sacred month of Rijab, when violence and thievery were forbidden. Muhammad couldn't pocket the booty because the offense was so heinous. This handy situational scripture, garbled as it may have been, said... The pagan month is important because I'm a pagan god, but I'm granting Muhammad a special exemption because I like him. Now that the booty was safely pocketed, it was time to encourage more of the same. Quran 2 verse 195 Spend your wealth in Allah's cause, fighting infidels, and be not cast by your own hand to perdition, and do good. Lo, Allah loves the doers of good. The Quran finally speaks of love, and wouldn't you know it, Allah loves jihadists, who do good by slaughtering in his cause. Now that fighting is good, Muslims need a place to fight. So it was off to perform properly according to the Prophet's Sunnah, the Hajj or Umrah, visiting Mecca for Allah. But if you are prevented, then send such gifts as you can afford. In other words, if you can't go and fight, send money so that others can fight. 
and do not shave your heads until the offering reaches the place of sacrifice. Fear Allah. He is severe in punishment. Send money even if you can fight. Quran 2, verse 215. They ask you what you should spend. Say, whatever they spend is good. Allah is aware of it. According to Allah, peace is bad and fighting is good. Quran 2, verse 216. Jihad, holy fighting in Allah's cause, is ordained for you, Muslims, though you dislike it. But it is possible that you dislike a thing which is good for you, and like a thing which is bad for you. But Allah knows, and you know not. Another translation reads, Warfare is ordained for you, though it is hateful unto you. This is an open-ended commandment to fight anyone and everyone who has not surrendered to Islam. How, pray tell, do the Islam is a peaceful religion folks explain? Jihad is ordained for you. Quran 2, verse 217. They question you concerning fighting in the sacred month. Say, fighting therein is a great or grave matter. But to prevent access to Allah, to deny Him, to prevent access to the sacred mosque, to expel its members and polytheism, are worse than slaughter. Nor will they cease fighting you until they make you renegades from your religion. If any of you turn back and die in unbelief, your works will be lost and you will go to hell. Surely those who believe and leave their homes to fight in Allah's cause have the hope of Allah's mercy. The Islamic God must be very small if access to him can be prevented by men. But that wasn't the purpose of this passage. Muhammad wanted the Ansar helpers, or hypocrites, to know that it would get very nasty if they didn't join his party. He wanted fighters, not pacifists. What's more, the last line suggests something that will be made abundantly clear in later surahs. Fight in my cause, and paradise will be yours. Muhammad had to be certain the Ansar knew that his party was not fun and games, so he had his God say, in Quran 2, verse 219, they ask you about wine and gambling. Say, in them is great sin and some profit for men, but the sin is greater than the profit. But if you are willing to gamble your soul on Muhammad's scheme, you'll find rivers flowing with wine. After polishing his war manifesto and get-rich-quick scheme, Muhammad turned his attention to his next favorite subject, women. Quranic laws were dictated that placed women in submissive roles to men, just as men had been placed in submission to Muhammad. To enforce his laws, he said, Big Brother is watching you. You'll be punished if you don't obey me. The dark spirit returned to the main theme of the surah, Fight because our enemies have mocked me and we hate them. The infidels were called a series of childish names. Then Mohammed convoluted Bible stories to make his crusade appear religious. These twisted portrayals continued through verse 257. A delusional trip down Jewish memory lane followed. Muhammad's twisted story of Abraham was as different from the original account as it was vulgar and insulting. Next, Allah attempted rational religious thought. His stories were moral and biblically inspired. But sadly, even the more rational passages focused on taxes, of which Muhammad was beneficiary. This led to a rant on interest and a discussion of business contracts starting in verse 275. The motivation? Muslims borrowed money from the Jews to survive. These sections were short on spirituality and long on pent-up rage. Quran 2, verse 244. Fight in Allah's cause and know that Allah hears and knows all. Verse 245. Who is he that will loan Allah a beautiful loan, which Allah will double to his credit and multiply many times? Allah's boy was broke and was begging for money. All Muhammad had to do to justify his new behavior was bastardize Hebrew scripture. Quran 2, verse 246. Have you not considered the chiefs of the Jews after Moses? They said to a prophet of theirs, Raise up for us a king, that we may fight in Allah's cause. He said, Would you refrain from fighting if fighting were prescribed for you? They said, How could we refuse to fight in Allah's cause, seeing that we are turned out of our homes? But when they were commanded to fight, they turned back, except a small band. 
According to Allah, peace is wrong. Some of the most incriminating Quranic errors are those in which Muhammad transparently projects his words and situation into the mouths and times of Jewish leaders. The Islamic scriptures have a complete disregard for time. Saul wasn't a contemporary of Moses. Therefore, in the context of history, this conversation was impossible. As such, it means that either Allah was a nincompoop, or Muhammad was an incompetent prophet, or both. Quran 2, verse 247. Their prophet said, Allah has appointed Talut, or Saul, as a king over you. They said, How can he exercise authority over us when we are better fitted than he, and he is not gifted with wealth? He said, Allah has chosen him above you in preference to you, and has gifted him with knowledge, physique, and stature. Allah grants his authority to him whom he pleases. Quran 2, verse 256. There is no compulsion in religion. That would be tolerant if Allah didn't abrogate the verse by proclaiming. In Quran 4, verse 90, If they turn back from Islam, becoming renegades, seize them and kill them wherever you find them. The second surah ends with Allah's lapdog telling his people what his master wanted to hear. Quran 2, verse 285, the messenger believes in what has been sent down to him, as do the believers. Each believes in Allah, his angels, his books, and his messengers. We make no distinction between his messengers, and they say, we hear and obey. The only reason such foolishness survived was the Islamic code. We hear and obey. Muslims don't think they obey. They don't believe they surrender. Muslims, like Germans, were deceived by an anti-Semitic charlatan. Bukhari. Allah's apostle said, Eloquent speech is as effective as magic. The prophet said, I have been given eloquent speech, and have been awarded victory by terror, so the treasures of the earth are mine. The former wannabe prophet turned pedophile pirate was a racist tyrant. Allah's apostle said, You should listen to and obey your ruler, even if he is a black African slave whose head looks like a raisin. He required obedience, not faith. Bukhari, the prophet said, A Muslim has to listen to and obey the order of his ruler, whether he likes it or not. Hitler and Mohammed were cut out of the same cloth. Hitler was stopped, Mein Kampf was exposed, and Nazism was eradicated as they could not coexist with a civilized world. Haven't Muhammad, the Quran, and Islam earned that same fate? Mm -hmm.